Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and with the opening of the organic scheme today, the government is targeting a conversion of 350,000 hectares of agricultural land to organics over the next five years. I'm joined by organic specialist Joe Kelleher to discuss the new scheme, tips and considerations for conversion to organic farming. Joe, you're very welcome. Today, the 9th of February marks the opening of the new organic scheme. Yes, uh, Catherine, thank you. Um, yep, yeah, we're we've been waiting for this scheme, so it's open today. Um, there's we're hoping that there'll be good interest. There's been a few rule changes that might entice a few extra farmers. We're currently at two percent of the land in Ireland under organic production, and we're trying to get that to seven and a half percent by 2027. So we're hoping this uh, opening of this scheme is the first step in getting towards that target. And how many farmers are currently in the organic scheme? There's about 2,000 across the country in the currently farming organics uh, or farming organically. Uh, the majority of them would be dry stock enterprises, uh, the beef and sheep enterprises in particular, and then the smaller enterprises would be the tillage, horticulture, dairy, uh, poultry would be the smaller ones. Um, I suppose it's just the, it typically tends to suit the dry stock farmers, but maybe they have less changes to make to convert to organically as a lot of them would be very extensive in nature anyway so that's probably the reason why there is probably more dry stock farmers in there rather than the other sectors and what are the typical systems of production on beef organic farms joe the beef systems we have a mixture really we that would be a breakdown pretty well you probably have majority of suckler farms and then we'd have a good few specialist finishing farms as well and really what we want i suppose in the organic scheme is we want a mixture of both uh kind of together so um, where you'd have the farmers either selling at weanland stage or maybe selling at 18 months of age stage where they take them to the end of the second grazing season um, and then uh, would sell them on to the specialised finishing farms. And we have some very good examples of specialist finishing farms where quite profitable enterprises um, fattening maybe up on 100 head of cattle, uh, typically on zero concentrate with a lot of use of red clover silage and whole crop silage uh, just to, to finish the cattle and they're, they, they, they are quite profitable. So a mixture of both really would be the, the ideal scenario. And where are the current markets for organic beef? The, you've, you have the main processors, which is your Good Herdsman in Care, and you have Slaney Meats in Wexford. Uh, they're the two main outlets for organic beef, and both of them are, uh, there's actually a shortage of organic beef in the country at the moment. Both of them are looking for cattle wherever they can get them organic cattle. Um, so they're, they're the primary outlets. But then you would have a lot of um, people, there's a good few beef farmers around the country that are selling direct to consumers uh, through kind of the beef in the box kind of a scheme. Um, then you'd have some of the smaller outlets and you'd have people selling to the local butchers, some of the health food stores. So there's, there's a lot of uh, varied uh, markets out there. And I suppose the nearer you can get to the consumer, the more value you can keep in the animal for yourself. Uh, so that's one of the big benefits of organic uh, farming and the direct selling option within that. And for farmers listening, Joe, interested in adopting an organic production system, what are the first steps to conversion? Well, the first step, Catherine, is the farmer has to convince him or herself that organic farming is an option for them. So you, you have to believe in the whole concept of organics and in the principles behind it. Um, so I suppose really you, you are farming with nature a bit more when you're farming organically. So you have to kind of ask yourself, can, can you see yourself doing that? Can you see yourself surviving without the bag of fertilizer or without the spray? Um, and if you do, uh, then maybe it is worth considering. Um, then once you've yourself converted and you've, your head got around the whole idea of it, then you have to look at what you need to do on your farm to convert to organic. So in the beef side of things, one of the big things is the housing. So um, is your housing suitable for organic farming? So one of the, the core requirements of organic farming is that 50% of the floor space has to be solid floor area and straw bedded ideally. So if you've the typical slatted shed you need to look at how can you get that straw lie back area uh, incorporated is it can you get access to existing sheds in the yard do you have to build a new straw lie back what's that going to cost you can you get tans grant aid on that and you have to look at the areas around that that's that's the key one for the dry stock farmers is is the housing side of it in terms of veterinary and other issues like that there's very little changes um the one of the core principles of organics is that the welfare 
example, is number one and it comes ahead of uh, most other things. So if an animal needs a certain product to treat a certain ailment, then that animal gets it. It's what happens before it and after it is where the difference comes in. So uh, the vet has to prescribe absolutely everything in organics when it comes to veterinary treatments. And the other change then is afterwards, most of the withdrawal periods are typically doubled um, in, in uh, organic systems. And in relation to the costs you highlighted there, the use of red clover silage, what profits would farmers expect? The, I suppose when you're looking at the profit of uh, an organic beef enterprise in particular, you have to look at a couple of elements really. So the first thing I suppose you'd look at is stocking rate. So if you take the average sucker farmer at the moment, it's stocked about 1.1 livestock units per hectare. So would you have to drop that in an organic situation? You probably would be dropping it a small bit, maybe down to one livestock unit or 0.9 would be typically what organic beef farmers would be operating at. That's kind of a, we'd call it a 10% drop in stocking rate. So that would mean a 10% probably drop in stock being sold. So that's, but then if you can access the organic markets, you should be able to get back another 10 or 10 to 20% of a premium back on that animal being sold. So your, your stock sales should remain near enough the same. You're selling less volume, but you're getting paid a bit more for it. Then you have to look at the cost side of things. So if your, if your current system involves a lot of meal feeding and you intend to continue with that, you're going to be buying organic meal um, and that is typically double the price of conventional meal. So you have to weigh that up. In the, in the ideal scenario, uh, as we outlined earlier, you'd be using red clover silage or whole crop silage to, to fatten cattle and try to re reduce your um, reliance on those inputs. Again, that's very much dependent on soil type too. Then the other cost, obviously, your fertilizer bill is eliminated. Uh, all your other variable costs will go up and down in line with your stock numbers and your fixed costs will remain fixed. So I suppose the, the, the one other bill, of course, that is going to change is the straw. If you're moving from slatted shed to straw bedded sheds, you're, you're going to incur a higher straw bill. And then there's the licensing and registration fees that go with becoming an organic farmer as well. So when you put the whole lot into the pot and mix it up, in general, you'd be hoping that the cost would be slightly lower than your current setup, um, but maybe not marginally lower. Um, but then you have the check in the post, which is um, should be completely available to the farmer. So that's all based on a per hectare basis. Um, so if you want the rates there under the new scheme, like it's the same as the previous scheme, it's 170 or 220 per hectare in the first two years. Then that rises to or drops to 170 after two years when your conversion period is over. And that's payable on up to 70 hectares. And the fact that the scheme is open today, Joe, what does a farmer have to do to be eligible to apply? And what are the stocking rate requirements for farmers? So one of the big changes, Catherine, in the new scheme is that the minimum stocking rate has dropped from a half a livestock unit down to 0.15 of a livestock unit. And that, that was actually proven very tricky for a lot of farmers, that 0.5, especially the hill sheep farmers, uh, because a lot of them would have a lot of land and maybe wouldn't be stocked very heavily on it, mountain type land. Um, and they would be struggling to hit the disadvantage stocking rate, which is the 0.15. So now the organic farming scheme has reduced the minimum stocking rate to line up with the disadvantage stocking rate or the ANC stocking rate of 0.15. So if you take the, the example, and it's probably the most extreme example, but take the example of a hill sheep farmer with 70 O's and 70 hectares. Under the old scheme, that farmer would have been receiving about 4,000 euros of a payment in conversion. In the new scheme, that same farmer will receive 15,400 euros of a payment in conversion. So it's, it's, it's quite significant the impact that has on that category of farmer. And that also applies then to the lowly stocked uh, beef farmer that may have quite a considerable range of land, uh, but maybe not very heavily stocked, um, maybe just clearing the, the stock rate for the disadvantage payment. That farmer now will, can benefit uh, fairly significantly from the organic scheme payment, and it's definitely uh, worth looking at as an option. Most definitely, Joe, particularly with the different changes in the stock and rate that you've highlighted. I suppose you've also mentioned the steps to conversion earlier, but for farmers that are listening and are interested in what you're after seeing, what do they need to do now in advance of the deadline for closing for the organic scheme? 
So yeah, I suppose when I was covering the steps there, I said the first two steps was to convince yourself and then to convert the farm. But I suppose the next step after that then is to contact one of the organic certification bodies. And there's two of them in this country. So for grassland farmers, you have the Organic Trust and you have the Irish Organic Association. And uh, any one of the two of them will issue you with a, a pack if you're thinking of converting to organics. So I would say contact one of them to get that pack. Uh, inside in that pack, then you will have what's called a conversion plan. Um, which is pretty much you outlining your story of what you have been doing and how you intend to convert to organics. Inside there also in that pack will be a, a herd health plan, which you must fill out with your vet just to outline kind of the history of the farm in term, terms of what issues maybe were on the farm, how you intend to address them going forward. Then there's uh, application forms and so on, like uh, bits like that, including a bit on soil fertility. When you've all that, you send that back to the certification body and they issue you with a license. And then once you have that license, you're entitled to apply to the Department of Agriculture for the organic farming scheme. Um, so I suppose if you are thinking of organics, I would say the first step would be to talk to the certification bodies and get that pack. Also, I would advise everyone just to have a chat with your advisor, go through the, the ins and outs of the application procedure. And I suppose if, any, if you do know an organic farmer in your locality, it would be well worth your while talking to them. They, they do typically tend to be very helpful, bulge, um, trying to help each other out. So they're normally very approachable and willing to help you and give you guidance on that. So try, try reach out maybe to a fellow organic farmer in your area and just get their thoughts on, on your conversion plans. And finally, Joe, when do farmers have to have all this paperwork completed by? So the 8th of April is the closing date, uh, Catherine, for the scheme. So it opens uh, today and it closes the 8th of April. So it's a two-month window. Um, so I suppose I, my advice would be to act earlier rather than later um, to, to get things moving. I suppose one point I didn't cover, maybe there was, there's also a requirement to do a 25-hour training course as part of the, the conversion. And if you did join the scheme this year, you have to the 1st of September of this year to get that 25 hour course completed and your cert uploaded to the Department of Agriculture. And how do they go about signing up for this training course? The Chagas website, if you go into the Chagas, if you, the easiest way is probably put into the search engine, uh, Chagas Organic Training, and it'll take you to a link where you can register for the 25 hour course and you're put on a waiting list. And according as we have adequate numbers in your area, uh, we'll be organizing courses throughout the year. Um, uh, so they'll be they'll be they're run pretty much every every month. There's a course on at some part of the country. Um, and the other thing I would just tell people again, if you go into the Chagas website, put in Chagas Organic and Events, and it'll take you to the the list of organic events that are coming up. And we have a series of webinars coming up around the country starting from next week and also we have a series of farm demo walks which are starting the first week in March and we'll continue throughout the summer 12 walks uh, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture and um, so there's and there's a few national events there as well on the last Wednesday of every month so there's a lot of events and a lot of places to get uh, pieces of information so I would say just look up the, the Chagas Organic website and you would see all the events that are happening over the next few months. That's great, Joe. Thanks very much. I'll include the links for all the events that you've highlighted in the text for the podcast. Thanks, Catherine. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Joe for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie. Or you can listen on Apple and Google podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef program, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.